Hey, just a warning there are spoilers in this video for Across the Spider-Verse amongst other things. If something's good it can't be spoiled though but this video is long enough without going into all that. Alright, let's do this one. More. Time. Wait, can I spoil the movie? Please? No. Get out of here Deadpool. Your mouth doesn't even move. Plus you're making bisexuality into a joke and fridging a character is deeply problematic. I agree with you Peter, but we don't have time for this. Can I just say something? No. No. Yes. You just did, kid. Want to say something else? Get on with it. Yes, get on with it! Yes! I am enjoying this scene. Get on with it! This channel does pop culture and media analysis, and I saw a film that would benefit from quite a lot of it. That's what you're getting this time. It's yet another trans Spider Gwen video. All right, let's do this one last time. A compelling entry point into this discussion lies in the animated film Spider Man Across the Spider Verse and its trans coded coloring of the character Spider Gwen, both literally and metaphorically. This discourse is going to explore the potential implications of queer interpretations, focusing on their power to add depth and nuance to our understanding of superhero identities and experiences. Spider-Gwen, an interdimensional iteration of the traditionally male superhero Spider-Man, raises intriguing questions about gender identity in superhero narratives. Her character provokes the question, should we need explicit confirmation to read a superhero as transgender? Should cisgender be our default assumption? I will resoundingly argue that no, we should not assume cisgender for superheroes to begin with, and I will argue that Gwen is trans, even if she isn't, for multiple different theoretical reasons, and also to make any bigots mad. As an example of what we'll delve into here, in Annette Kolodny's Dancing Through the Minefield, she introduces the theory of multiple valid readings of a given text, which counters traditional assumptions about a single superior interpretation. This approach echoes the essence of Miles Morales' choice in Across the Spider-Verse, rejecting the notion of a singular, correct, or canonical reading. In these notes where the lines converge, they are the kin. Chapters that are a part of every spider story, every time. Some good, some bad. The concept argues that a text does not exist in a vacuum, but is dynamically shaped and interpreted by each reader's unique social cultural context and experiences. In this light, we can view Spider-Gwen's narrative through various lenses, from her superhero exploits to her symbolic journey of self-acceptance that mirrors the experience of many transgender individuals. Each interpretation dances its unique path through the textual minefield, offering different insights without one superseding the others. Therefore, in my analysis, I aim to echo Kaladni's concept and explore many multifaceted interpretations of Spider-Gwen's story, promoting diversity and fluidity in narrative understanding. Ready? It's time to dance through a minefield of cannons. That's a very funny joke if you can see the script. I hope you can hear homonyms. Let's start at the beginning one last time. Expanding beyond Spider-Gwen, this discourse will examine other iconic figures in the comic book world that may also be interpreted as transcoded. This approach compels us to reconsider our interpretive frameworks and challenges us to explore the richness and complexity of superhero identities beyond traditional cisgender and heteronormative perspectives. The objective of this analysis is not to impose a trans identity on these characters, but to broaden our perspectives and appreciate the multifaceted nature of their narratives, to live comfortably with not knowing and not assuming cisgender as standard. Critical theory, queer theory, stemming from LGBTQ plus studies and feminist theories, questions the assumptions and norms associated with heterosexuality and binary gender identities. This critical lens deconstructs societal norms, pushing us to question, redefine, and broaden our understanding of identity, sexuality, and power relations. In the context of superheroes, queer theory encourages us to examine the characters and narratives beyond conventional heterosexual and cisgender interpretations, concerning how their experiences may resonate with queer experience and identities. Several prominent superheroes offer compelling grounds for a queer interpretation. Consider Superman, an alien living among humans, perpetually caught between two identities, Clark Kent and Superman. However, there is a problem that we could further interrogate of Superman being an alien, the alien other always being the queer identity. That is why Spider-Gwen, who is human, 
is so important to read as trans, even if it is not explicitly stated in the text. Similarly, the character of Mystique in the X-Men series is a shapeshifter, constantly changing her appearance, but never quite fitting in. Then set it to blow! How long have you been impersonating the professor? Alex, what a... These experiences echo those of transgender individuals who may feel caught between their assigned gender and their true identity. Bruce Banner, also known as the Hulk, offers yet another perspective. His transformation in the Hulk can be read as a metaphor for the anger and frustration experienced by a transgender individual forced to hide their true identity, dealing with a society that rejects them, that makes them into a monster. Queer theory gives us the tools to explore these characters and their stories in a deeper, more empathetic way, providing a more inclusive and nuanced perspective. Okay, time to flex my, I have an English degree and a half and read critical theory for fun muscles. Let's go. Okay, let's do this one last time, yeah? For real this time, this is it. Exploring these narratives through the lens of theorists such as Jacques Derrida, Ferdinand de Saussure, Annette Kalatny, and Judith Butler offers a multi-layered analysis. Derrida's deconstruction allows us to examine binary oppositions inherent in superhero narratives and to go beyond this binary into a non-binary existence. Saussure's semiotics aids in understanding the symbolism and signs in these narratives, while Kalatny's pluralistic model suggests that these texts can have multiple valid interpretations. This is important when we're considering this idea of there being a canon, and hey, who gets to decide on the canon anyway? Why is it called a canon? Like a church work that someone else chooses for us? What's a retcon if canon is immutable? And what happened to Gwenpool? Did they make her a boring mutant instead of her own thing that was specific and special? And I'm losing the thread here. Hold on, where was I? Oh, yes. Judith Butler's concept of gender performativity informs our understanding of characters' identities, revealing them as social constructs subject to change and transformation. Thus, by drawing upon these theories, we can enrich our analysis of superhero narratives. And we can show that through each of these theories, it makes sense to read Gwen as trans. Let's start to approach this using Derrida's ideas. Derrida's deconstruction involves challenging binary oppositions and hierarchies in the text and narratives. A key tenet of Derrida's thought is that binary oppositions are not equal, but hierarchical, although we're going to break that down in a moment. One term is always privileged or considered superior to another. However, when we look at these tensions, we can see how they pull apart. Applying this to Gwen Stacy, her identity is Gwen Stacy, and her identity as Spider-Woman exists in a sort of binary opposition. Society might prioritize her identity as Gwen, viewing it as more authentic or real due to societal norms that privilege normal civilian lives over extraordinary, unusual identities. However, deconstruction would challenge this hierarchy, asserting that Gwen's superhero identity is just as valid and real as her civilian identity. They're not two separate entities, but intertwined parts of the whole. This reflects the experience of many transgender individuals who must navigate a society that often privileges cis identities and views them as more authentic and real. Derrida's big concept of deferrance can also play a significant role here. Deferrance refers to the idea that meanings are deferred and determined by their differences and differences from other terms. We defer the meaning. The term différence coined by Derrida is a portmanteau of the French words différer to differ and différence to defer. It captures two simultaneous yet paradoxical processes at the heart of language and meaning making. The aspect of difference suggests that our understanding of a term or a concept is based on its difference from other terms. We only know day because it is not night. We understand happiness because it is not sadness. We understand spider man because it is not Batman. In this sense, meaning is relational and oppositional, arising from difference rather than inherent characteristics. The aspect of differal implies that meaning is not fixed or final, but constantly deferred and open to reinterpretation, which is important in a world of multiple authors like comic books. Each word points to other worlds, and the intended meaning is always just out of reach, deferred to the next word or the next interpretation. This infers a fluidity in an ongoing process of change and transformation within language, destabilizing any idea of fixed or inherent meaning. As soon as you think you have the meaning, it will change. In the context of Gwen Stacy, this means that her identity as Spider-Woman is understood in its difference from her identity as Gwen Stacy, an ordinary teenager. The superhero identity is defined by what it is not. It is not the ordinary, everyday persona of Gwen Stacy. However, Derrida's difference also allows for the constant deferral of meaning. Gwen's identity as Spider-Woman isn't fixed or static, but continually evolving and reshaping based on her experience and circumstances while she is Gwen and while she is Spider-Woman, just like the ongoing process of identity, assertion, formation, experienced by many people transgender and cisgender alike. 
all identities are in a constant process of differentiation and deferral, and no identity is a fixed static entity. We are not the same person today as we were five years ago, for example. In the same vein, Gwen's identities as Gwen Stacy and Spider-Woman are interdependent and continually evolving, deferring to each other, reflecting the fluid and multifaceted nature of identity itself. By the way, this is where the boring idea of the movie doesn't say she's trans, so she's not, can go and die. The film presents Gwen as a multifaceted character, hinting at aspects of her identity without explicitly labeling them. Specifically, regarding Gwen's possible trans identity, the narrative leaves clues without making any overt declaration. This is an embodiment of Derrida's idea of difference. Gwen's trans identity isn't fully defined or explicitly contrasted with cis identity within the film. Instead, its meaning is deferred, left for us to make assumptions, and it's held in a state of tantalizing ambiguity. This approach undermines cis normative assumptions that because she is not specifically said to be trans, she must be cisgender. Therefore, it is challenging the conventional requirement for clearly delineated and binary understandings of gender. So not only is this a trans allegory, it is a non-binary allegory. Rather than relying on clear cis-trans distinctions, it promotes the understanding of gender as a spectrum with identities that are fluid and not strictly defined by cis-normative standards. This is transhuman, and this is transcending gender. Therefore, it is definitely within the transgender umbrella. This deferment of clear definition for Gwen's trans identity complicates and enriches our understanding of her character. And this is that we view her not through the narrow lens of a binary gender framework, but as a complex individual whose gender identity is one facet of her multifaceted persona. The emphasis is placed not on labeling and categorizing her, but on acknowledging and appreciating the complexity of her character and her full identity. In addition, through Derrida's lens, the storyline of Gwen Stacy and her father's acceptance of her dual identity near the end of the movie could be seen as mirroring the journey of many transgender people. His acceptance can be seen as symbolic acceptance of Gwen's complexity and a defiance of a strict binary system that privileges one identity over the other. In addition, his understanding of this leads him to reject his previous profession, which is upholding the system that categorizes people into binaries, cop versus vigilante, cis versus trans. This provides a compelling argument for reading Gwen Stacy as a character who disruptively navigates identity, much like transgender individuals do in our society. We could go beyond this further and bring in Baudrillard's work, Simulacra and Simulacrum, and his later work, especially an essay called We Are All Transsexual Now, that suggests that in a society that so rigidly tries to force people into a binaries by the fact that none of us can live up to the definitions, we are all under the pressure not to actually exist in the world as the rigid definition of the performed man or woman. More on this later when we get to Judith Butler. We are moving on now, however, to Ferdinand de Saussure. Ferdinand de Saussure's semiotics examines systems of signs and symbols embedded in language and other modes of communication. These signs, according to Saussure, are made up of two parts, the signifier, the form which the sign takes, and the signified, the concept it represents. This dyadic structure of signs allows for the creation of interpretation of meaning in various textual forms. So Saussure's semiotics, therefore, offers a tool to discern and interpret the symbolic elements within the visual and narrative components of comic books and animated films. In the Across the Spider-Verse scenes involving Gwen Stacy and her father, the use of trans pride colors provides a rich tapestry for applying Saussure's semiotics and exploring trans readings. Firstly, these colors are signifiers that embody the concept of the transgender identity, an identity often misunderstood and marginalized, yet resilient and vibrant. They signify the struggle, acceptance, and self-realization associated with being transgender. These colors are more than just a visual spectacle. They represent the spirit of the trans community, their fight for recognition, and their journey towards self-affirmation. These colors don't run. This scene is a turning point in the relationship between Gwen and her father. The trans pride colors in the background melting like tears. And they can only know half of who I am offer a poignant metaphor. They symbolize the emotional transformation within Gwen and her father, the shedding of misconceptions and the emergence of acceptance. And now I don't, I don't even know what the right thing is anymore. I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I know I can't lose one more friend. Gwen, I always taught you to do it by the book. Yeah, and how did that work out? I took an oath. Then arrest me, Dad. <laughs> Get it over with. I... I can't. Why not? Because I quit. This is a crucial moment where the symbol of the trans pride colors, the signifier, aligns perfectly with the emotional narrative, the signified. 
It's a clear demonstration of Saucer's semiotics at play, with the colors serving as a signifier that carries profound meaning. The colors melting like tears could signify the often painful process of coming out, the struggle for acceptance, and the ultimate relief when that acceptance is given. In a broader sense, Gwen's journey symbolized by these colors mirrors the journey many transgender individuals undertake. Thus, through the lens of Saucer's semiotics, through our understanding of the signifier, the colors and the signified, the emotional coming out story, this scene enriches our understanding of Gwen's character and is a potent symbol of her trans pride. Let's compare this with another comic book character. If we dig deep enough into Alan Moore's Watchmen and the character Rorschach, we can highlight a cesarean semiotics that shows how he also embodies a queer experience. First, we need to address Cesare's idea of the signifier and the signified two inseparable parts of a sign. You cannot have one without the other, just as you cannot have the trans pride colors without the trans pride meaning. The signifier is the form that a sign takes, such as word, sound, or image. The signified is the concept or meaning the sign represents. So Sarah emphasized that the relationship between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary, which means it's based on social agreement than any other inherent natural connection. When we apply this concept to Rorschach, the signifier would be his mask with shifting ink blots. The mask is literally not a fixed image. Instead, it's a constantly changing pattern that offers a different interpretation with each shift. It is a physical manifestation of the arbitrariness Saucer highlighted. The fact that it can be interpreted differently by different observers adds to its fluidity. It's the perfect embodiment of a semiotic sign as it is a physical form signifier representing an abstract concept signified, and the connection between the two is based on the viewer's interpretation. The varied interpretations of Rorschach's mask can reflect the misunderstandings or misinterpretations that transgender or queer people often face from others who don't understand their identity. Through this lens, Rorschach's mask serves as a symbol of mutable identity and the subjective nature of perception. He too can be trans or queer or anybody under the mask, especially given the events of Doomsday Clock. No, I'm not thinking too much into it. You're not thinking enough into it. That, that's called attitude. Let's look at it from a different point of view, our third point of view. We're going to take a look at it from the point of view of Judith Butler. Judith Butler's groundbreaking theory of gender performativity asserts that gender is not an intrinsic quality, but a construct that is continually reenacted and performed based on societal expectations. Butler's theory of performativity doesn't suggest that we consciously choose our gender roles, but rather these roles are assigned and enforced by societal norms, and that through repeated enactment, these roles harden into perceived realities. Applying Butler's theory to Gwen Stacy offers us a compelling interpretation. At the core of Gwen's narrative is the tension and interplay between her two identities, the ordinary teenager Gwen Stacy and the extraordinary superhero spider woman. Each identity requires its performance dictated by the respective societal expectations around each role. As Gwen, she's expected to navigate the norms of teenage life. There's a good speech on. No wonder you got an A in English. B. I got a B. Plus. Missed a few classes. While as Spider-Woman, she must embody the principles and expectations of a superhero while also avoiding her societal definition as a vigilante. In essence, each identity Gwen assumes can be seen as a performance that is put on her by the others around her. Vampire Gwen guy. I'd pay good money to see that. So how long ago did they invite you? Uh, only like a few months ago. A month is kind of a long time, isn't it? Okay, this one comes with two. All of my feels were already dead. And if I could rewind if you could... This duality in Gwen's character offers a critique of the very idea of a fixed identity, including gender identity. I wrote duality there, but I said that there were at least three different things. So it's not the duality, it's a multiplicity. Multiplicity. This multiplicity definitely works when reading her as trans. Gwen's ongoing transition from ordinary girl to superhero underscores this fluidity and the changeability of identity, challenging the perception of inherent unchangeable identity constructs. Butler's concept of gender performativity thus gives us a lens to understand Gwen's dual identities and how they reflect a broader critique of societal norms and expectations. The fluidity embodied in Gwen's character resonates particularly with the experiences of transgender individuals. Whether they want to or not, transgender individuals often challenge and disrupt traditional notions of fixed or binary gender identities. Just as Gwen moves between her ordinary and superhero personas, transgender people navigate a world where they must think about the performative aspects and the mutable nature of identity. Much like Gwen, America Chavez, who was criminally misused in the last Doctor Strange movie, negotiates multiple identities. Oh, we're friends. You're killing me. I know. But in the grand calculus of the multiverse, your sacrifice is worth more than your life. Her Latinx heritage, her queer identity, and her superhero persona. 
once again, there are multiple places where a character is negotiating their identity. More on that later. Chavez, a secondary version of a character originally called Miss America, illustrates Butler's idea of performing gender and other social roles. Her identity as the next Miss America demands a performance of strength, resilience, heroism, while her identity as a queer woman of color encompasses its own set of societal expectations and norms. The portrayal of America Chavez allows for an exploration of the intersection of these identities when not sidelined by having to be in a Doctor Strange film, thereby offering a critique of societal constructs of race, gender, and sexuality. For America Chavez, the act of heroism itself can be seen as performative, something she does rather than she inherently is. She can be led astray, much like many characters can. If a superhero can't be tempted, that hero part doesn't work, especially because the old formula of the hero is that heroes have a fatal flaw. While superheroes in general are expected to always win, they are still people in their construction that must have flaws. They must also be negotiating their identity or they're not interesting. If Superman isn't specifically trying to figure out, is he a Kryptonian? Is he a human? Is he a secret third thing? Then he is not interesting because he has the tensions between all of the different expectations that are placed on him by the society around him. He also has to navigate between Lex Luthor and the people that do not like superheroes and the people that adore him. What does it mean to be the big blue Boy Scout when perhaps you just want to go home and work on a farm in Smallville? Back to America Chavez, in Butler's terms, America's superhero persona becomes a space to challenge norms and express power. This performance is not confined to her realm of superhero duties. It permeates her personal life, too. As a queer woman of color in the public eye, she inherently challenges the societal norms around race, sexuality, and gender. Her very existence, both as a superhero and a queer woman of color, becomes a critique of the societal expectations that seek to confine individuals within rigid identity constructs. If we follow Butler... Both gender and superheroing is what you do. Superheroing is what you do. Sounds like a PSA. As I've mentioned earlier in the video, one important idea in theory is looking at things from a multiplicity of angles, a multiverse of angles. Just as cubist artwork shows multiple perspectives at once, we should view stories from multiple different perspectives. There will be more on this when I discuss intersectionality a bit later too, but for now we're back talking again about Annette Kaladny's suggestion in her classic essay, Dancing Through the Minefield. Her pluralistic model proposes that text is open to multiple valid interpretation. Each reader brings their perspective, informed by their personal experiences and cultural context, leading to a variety of understandings. In her essay, Kaladni uses the metaphor of a minefield to describe the inherent risks in literary interpretation, the possibility of having one's reading challenged, critiqued, or even outright dismissed. These are good things, she says. Dancing through this minefield, then, refers to the act of navigating these potential criticisms by embracing a multiplicity of readings. It involves acknowledging that one's interpretation is but one among many valid perspectives, one among many valid Spider-Man stories, each shaped by the reader's unique cultural, social, and personal context. Rather than seeking a singular, definitive interpretation, Kaladny's approach encourages us to celebrate the rich tapestry of readings that a text can inspire. If we apply this to Gwen Stacy's narrative, a dance through the minefield of interpretation could yield many, many valid readings, some of which I've already given. One perspective might view her as a typical superhero focusing on her battles with villains, her web-slinging acrobatics, and her contribution to maintaining law and order in the city. Yet another perspective informed by an awareness of queer narratives could see Gwen's transformation into Spider-Woman as symbolic of a personal journey towards self-realization and acceptance, mirroring the experiences, especially in coming out of transgender individuals. To further complicate the dance, we could consider perspectives that interrogate socio-political context of Gwen's story. For instance, a feminist reading might scrutinize how Gwen navigates a largely male-dominated superhero landscape, while a cultural studies approach might explore how Gwen's narrative reflects her challenges, societal attitudes toward young women in power. These various readings, though different, are not mutually exclusive. They can coexist and even intermingle in enriching our understanding of Gwen's story. Similarly, if we apply this approach to, say, the Catherine Kane Batwoman, our dance might lead us to explore her narrative not just as a vigilante story, but also as a narrative about LGBTQ plus visibility and representation in mainstream comics. We might also consider perspectives that focus on her religious and cultural identity as a Jewish woman or the sociopolitical implications of her military background. Again, each reading adds a unique layer to our understanding of Batwoman's narrative, contributing to a multifaceted interpretation that echoes the complexity of real world identities and experiences. Experiences. So there you have it, four different ways of dancing through the minefield, all of which, in my mind at least, suggest that we can definitely read Gwen as trans, and that we should actually probably read more superheroes as trans. 
So let's put it all together. With Derrida, we're told not to assume Gwen isn't trans just because the movie doesn't say so outright. Instead, Derrida urges us to rethink the way we understand gender identities and the hierarchies between them, moving away from this binary and the rigid labels, deconstructing them. In all technicality, this is going beyond Derrida, who is very much about putting the hierarchies back together. And we are moving into a postmodern version of this that says we stay with the deconstruction because rebuilding a hierarchy is part of the problem. So Sarah's semiotics is about understanding the symbols. The trans pride colors in Gwen's scenes aren't just random. They're broadcasting Gwen's trans identity to those who can read the signs. You either understand how to read the symbols or you don't. Next, Butler talks about how identities are performed. Gwen's transformation as Spider-Woman isn't just about her superhero shenanigans. It's also about how we perform and understand gender roles in society and how these performances shape our identities. And finally, Kaladney encourages us to embrace multiple perspectives. The narrative of Gwen Stacy isn't just one story, but many. Like Miles, who defies the notion of a single canon, we should approach Gwen's story from various angles, acknowledging that there's no singular right interpretation, but picking from the best lenses. This is also where I give you the throwaway line to think about Miles also being trans if you were to read the movie very, very carefully. But I don't know if you're ready to think about that. If you are, see the excellent Council of Geeks video about reading the film that way, which I have linked below. Each of these lenses provides a different way to look at Gwen's story. When we combine them, we get a richer, more complex understanding of her character, just as Miles does when he rejects the idea of a single canon and chooses his own path. So to believe that with all of these lenses, Gwen assists by default, actually misses reading the movie with any rigor. Bam, there you go. That should wrap it up, right? Uh, unless you looked at how much time is left. There's a big caveat with these ideas, and it would be irresponsible for me not to mention it. Spider Gwen, aka Gwen Stacy from Across the Spider Verse, is trans because the best readings I can come up with show how she can be trans. You can keep her as cis if you want, but it's kind of gross and that that's just the default assumption. It's weird that anyone assumes what is in anyone's pants. For the reasons I've outlined above, this Gwen is trans. I do think that this was not intentional in the first movie, but I don't have time to go into all of that now. However, queer and trans issues are not the only marginalized people that benefit from being read into comic books. The best comic books know this. That's why we need to consider intersectionality within trans Gwen discourse. The importance of an intersectional analysis also comes to the fore in this discourse. Intersectionality, a concept coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, underscores the interconnectedness of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender. In other words, intersectionality suggests that people's social identities and related systems of oppression, domination, and discrimination are linked and must be examined together rather than as separate entities. It's about understanding how a person's various identities combine to create unique modes of discrimination and of privilege. For example, a Black woman in the U.S. doesn't face racism and sexism independently, but experiences them simultaneously. This can lead to unique forms of prejudice prejudices and biases that wouldn't be understood by looking at race and gender separately. A queer reading of superhero narratives brings an added layer of complexity to intersectional analyses. A character like Tony Stark, Iron Man, for example, invites a reading about non-binary identity given his recent transformation into AI and then back again in one storyline, therefore transcending gender norms. Yet his character also grapples with issues like his wealth and his privilege, his mental health and his substance abuse. His privilege for his wealth but he does not have privilege because of his addiction to alcohol and other drugs. He can always get out of trouble because he can always pay to get out of trouble, which is the same in the case of Batman, but all of them are dealing with their own issues because of this intersectional cross-section of power. Batman and Tony Stark probably have all the privilege in the world, however. So they each have problems and are worth exploring, but this privilege that they have stemming from them being rich white men trademark really gives them more power than most other characters. Not the case with a character I haven't talked about yet that is the title of this video. Character Frank Castle, better known as the Punisher, is the quintessential embodiment of hyper masculinity in the realm of comic books. A former Marine, Castle's narrative is steeped in the themes of violence, revenge, and vigilante justice, all of which are often associated with the traditional, even archaic notions of masculinity. His character design, behavior, choices, and general discourse surrounding him all amplifies these masculine traits to an almost theatrical degree. 
think about the trucks you see the Punisher logo on. This exaggeration invites a reading of Frank Castle through the lens of Judith Butler's concept of gender performativity and more specifically, drag. Butler's seminal work, Gender Trouble, <laughs> seminal, posited that gender is not something we are, but something we do, a performance we continuously enact. Drag, in this sense, is an exaggerated, often theatrical performance of gender norms that exposes the constructed nature of gender identities. For Butler, drag demonstrates the imitation at the heart of all gender performance, thereby destabilizing the perceived naturalness of gender roles and identities. Frank Castle can thus be read as a drag king, overperforming his masculinity. His seemingly incessant pursuit of vigilante justice, refusal to show emotional vulnerability and near masochistic acceptance and near masochistic acceptance of physical violence and punishment can be viewed as a hyperbolized performance of stereotypically macho behaviors. He embodies the tough guy stereotype to such an extreme that it borders on caricature, making his character a form of drag performance of masculinity, just like Peacemaker in the DC universe. This dragging of masculinity, however, serves a dual purpose. On one hand, it underscores Castle's personal trauma and the toll his mission of revenge takes on his mental and emotional well-being. On the other hand, it highlights the dangerous allure of toxic masculinity, especially when it becomes entwined with notions of justice and righteousness. Again, like Peacemaker. I cherish peace with all my heart. I don't care how many men, women, and children I need to kill to get it. Castle's narrative thus serves as both an examination and a critique of, of hypermasculinity, underlining the destructiveness and unsustainability of such a performance. Therefore, while not transcoded in the traditional sense, Frank Castle's overperformance of masculinity invites a queer reading that aligns with Butler's theory of gender as a performative act. This perspective provides a richer, more nuanced understanding of his character and contributes to broader discussions about gender dynamics and superhero narratives. On the other hand, certain characters, such as Luke Cage, necessitate a centered intersectional approach where their Black identity is crucial to understanding their narrative. Such examples underscore the importance of employing multiple theoretical perspectives to capture the nuances of these complex characters fully. Luke Cage, a superhero firmly rooted in the Black culture and the struggles of the marginalized communities of Harlem, offers a unique case that shows the limitations of applying a queer reading universally. Show the man what you famous for. Luke's character was created as a response to the black exploitation genre of the 1970s, is deeply connected to themes of race, socioeconomic status, and systemic oppression. His character has been centered on his experiences as a black man in America. His embodiments of strength and his resilience in the face of adversity has made him a symbol of empowerment for the black community. Luke's narrative is primarily focused on racial injustice in the black experience in America rather than questions of his gender identity or sexuality. His experiences are contextualized by his race and his masculinity, and he appears comfortable in his gender identity. He does not exhibit the sense of being caught between two identities that we find in characters like Superman or Mystique or even Gwen Stacy in Across the Spider-Verse. His storyline does not involve transformations akin to those experienced by Bruce Banner or Tony Stark. His storyline is not about being an alien like Superman. Instead, his narrative is grounded in his reality as a Black man facing the everyday struggles of systemic injustice. That is not to say that Black individuals or characters cannot be transgender or have queer experiences. However, in the case of Luke Cage, his narrative and character development have not explicitly or implicitly explored themes of gender fluidity, transformation, or non-binary identity. Instead, his story seems to center on his experience with race and class. This analysis of Luke Cage illustrates an important caveat to the broader argument. While many, many superhero narratives lend themselves to a trans or queer reading, this is not universally applicable. Unless a character is explicitly identified as cisgender, there may be a potential for a queer reading. However, such a reading should not be imposed universally or without consideration for the specific context and themes of the character's narrative. I hope I have argued above exactly why Spider-Gwen should be read this way. It is also essential to remember that queer readings are not the only lens through which to view these narratives. Characters like Luke Cage, whose stories are deeply intertwined with their racial and socioeconomic identities, underscore the importance of intersectional analysis. America Chavez also resists a trans interpretation because she is specifically a named queer woman, as are her two mothers. A multiplicity and intersection of issues is important in the best of comics writing ongoing today, including everyone's narratives, but not arriving at a cisgender default for characters. 
Their narratives remind us that while we should seek to deconstruct and challenge heteronormative and cisnormative assumptions, we must also be aware of the complexities and nuances of individual characters in their stories. Hopefully from this very short video, look, I took this joke from the list of approved YouTube jokes for long videos. I'm sure it's council approved. It's clear that superhero narratives hold so much more than what meets the eye, particularly when it comes to exploring complex themes such as gender identity. In viewing these narratives from multiple perspectives, be it Derrida's deconstruction, Saussure's semiotics, Butler's performativity, or Kaladny's pluralism, we uncover nuanced trans and queer interpretations that echo real world experiences and identities. This multiplicity of interpretations is akin to a superhero dancing their way through the minefield, where we embrace numerous perspectives, acknowledging their validity and enriching our understanding. If the journey doesn't stop here, it's crucial that we question and challenge the heteronormative and cisgender assumptions that have long been the default in our society. This may seem radical, I hope so, but it's a necessary step in disrupting binary restrictive views on gender and restrictive views on identity in general. Indeed, the idea isn't to deny cisgender identities, but rather to level the playing field where all identities are seen and considered and valid and loved. So perhaps the real radical act is this, read all characters as trans or non-binary until otherwise stated. The shift in perception doesn't just open up the richness of narratives and characters, it also mirrors the diverse complex reality of human identities. In this way, our reading of superhero narratives becomes a metaphor for social change, one where acceptance, inclusivity, and diversity are not the exception, but the norm. So what do I want you to remember? What's the takeaway as you like and subscribe? Frank Castle is a drag king. And Gwen Stacy is trans by default until cisgender isn't the default. W will I say it? Will I say the Stanley thing? No, but you just heard it in your head.